Yep, that's me. That's me in all my glory. Uh, I am uh, an accidental healthpreneur. Now, I say that because I actually was going to be a health entrepreneur. In my life, I've been a ton of things. I've been a chemist. I've been an investor. I've been an innovator. I've been a delegate at the White House. You don't find me there much anymore. But I was there, and I was even in Southeast Asia protecting the Sumatran rhino from extinction, which is a tall order, and I'm very short, so it was tough fighting palm oil. So I have a habit of doing the impossible and creating awareness around those things that are really not obvious. And so my journey from college and from the last several years have taken me from a place where I thought I was going to do the kind of expected thing, be a doctor like my dad and live that dream. Well, I experienced my first entrepreneurial pivot in college, and I decided that that wasn't going to be for me, that I was going to go and take that chemistry degree and actually work for this little company that, that made a white powder, but I wanted to market it internationally. And so that's what I did with both feet. I convinced them to hire me, believe it or not. And then I ended up in this first of its kind corporate incubator where I was trying to replace that beautiful powder that was the cash cow for that company. And so I spent a number of years commercializing new business ideas or trying to and was successful in doing so. And so over the years, I've, I've looked at things and examined things and tried to find a way to make things work. But today, I stand here before you as a STEM BA that promotes STEM STEAM stream. But what makes me tick is STEM squared. That squared M is all about medicine. And so I have taken my life, and this is what I do all day, every day, is 3D print body parts. I innovate around the 3D technology. After that first pivot, I never thought I'd find myself back here, but here I am. I now not only uh, print 3D, but I think 3D, and I find my heart beats in 3D, and I'm always in the 3D dimension. And so I'm focused on how do we take the impersonalized medicine and make it more personalized? How do we take the imprecise and make it more precise? Because Innovation abounds, and the world is becoming very personal. Everything we do has to cater to you. Businesses are finding that that's the X factor. That's the, the success factor. How does, how does a company like Uber work? Well, it thinks about you and me and what we need. And so as I look around in, in, across the globe, I'm seeing all these innovation hubs pop up. And Chicago, albeit these are fintech hubs, is represented in kind of the, the laggard cohort because they're slow, less in number and uh, less evolved than the European companies. So we've, we've got a long way to, to kind of level set within the money sector. But as I have always found, where money goes, businesses grow. And so in healthcare, it's no different. Uh, but what's been remarkable is that there's reports out there saying that there are more hubs out there and not enough startups. 15,000 startups in this mobile health space, right? Other related communities and that the growth rate is going down. I find that astonishing because where I come from, I've got places like Matter next door in Texas, the TMCX that are leveraging public-private partnerships and they're leveraging dollars beyond my wildest imagination. And they're really building around ecosystems like we have here in Chicago. 
in Minnesota, they've just announced in the last few months like a practically a billion dollar investment across healthcare to bridge the patients with the doctors, with the entrepreneurs, to bring this innovation to bear. But no matter what, every one of us in this room knows that even if you have the best idea, it is the market that needs to find the home. So in my life, I've been continually looking for how do I fit? Where do I go? How do I grow? And in the world of healthcare, we all have to do the same kind of thing. Now, when I was trying to uh, adapt and fit in, you know, when I was a kid, I was selling candy, and I, I figured that that was the way to get friends and to build a market and to scale and to figure out how do you connect with people. The same thing has to happen here, right? Well, what's been interesting for me as I've been privileged, and I do mean privileged, to have a seat at this healthcare table is that I'm finding that there's a lot of inequity. There's a lot of exclusion. There's perhaps some lack of fairness in this space and place of healthcare. That somehow I haven't been counted as a woman. I haven't really been factored in the overall approach and planning for devising quality health care. So I got to tell you, it made my head scratch because I thought, this is a pretty fundamental thought, right? I'm a woman. I'm needing health care. I should be treated for me specifically. But what I'm finding is that in this world of health care, there is a gender blind spot. And while no one said life was going to be fair, and I didn't expect that, and I didn't expect to be treated equally, but I expected to be treated fairly, and I didn't get that seat at the table, I had to earn it. But what I didn't realize is that the world, in every possible facet, appears to have been built for these guys. The 75 kilogram white male, the doors, the cars, the chairs, everything that we do is ostensibly benchmarked against this figure. How does that map to healthcare? So the drugs that we are given to treat ailments? Yep, for that guy. The devices designed generally for that guy. The treatments for the guy. Are you counting the guys over there? Who's doing the app? Who's counting that app? So, so our world is really biased tremendously. And so there are definite differences, right? We know that there are things like pregnancy and hormones that are kind of differentiate men from women, right? But the point is that we are not all the same. We have learned, I learned recently, that every bloody cell has a sex. How profound is that? I'm sure you, you can tell us all about that. But the 70 kilogram white male is how we're building our world. And, and no two people are alike. Not even twins are alike. And I can recall. So here's my dad, the cardiovascular surgeon, right? Treating me for some infection. And don't you know that my mom intuitively would say to me, now, you break that pill in half because you don't need the whole thing. Now, she knew we weren't the same as the universal treatment, right? Because maybe I was smaller, maybe I wasn't needing all of that. And there's my dad scoffing at her because he's got all the answers, right? Right, guys? So, so I grew up with that kind of uh, difference and, and observation that there was not a, a, a a perfect answer for everything. And so as, as I've grown into the health where, healthcare field, I've really started to see that all of these organs are rendered differently between the sexes, and we're learning more and more and more. And so if you think about how we've, we've managed our healthcare system, we've, done, we, we've taken treatments in a universal fashion, and that has, I believe, affected not only the economic, but the quality of life itself. 
And so, because we didn't start at the beginning, we didn't factor in the considerations of what does the individual need and what are the factors that we need to include before we formulate and design and deliver because that's where it shows up. The readmissions, the repeats are, in my opinion, partly due to, to the fact that we didn't really factor the individual. And so the, there are clear evidence-based information about where these deltas are. And I'm going to talk about three specific areas. And by the way, the NIH has finally declared that they're not funding research unless it considers sex and gender in clinical trials. So that's, that's kind of a huge thing, that they have said no money unless you can demonstrate you're including variables across many different uh, sectors. And so that's a fundamental change in our healthcare drug development, device development. That's huge for us. So take the case of a woman. A woman's heart is truly different than a man's heart. Our heart attacks present differently. The symptoms. For a woman, she pretty much declines that she even has symptoms, right? Because we don't, we don't show. We've got the stiff upper lip. The treatments that are given, for example, like aspirin, that, that wonder drug, works to prevent the first heart attack in a man, but not a woman. On that basis alone, you can extrapolate numerous applications of where these deltas live and exist. And so we're finding that women are just hiding behind uh, the veil of, of caregiving and not taking care of themselves. And the rate of heart attacks is increasing and exceeding that of males. And so we've got to take note and we've got to start looking at the front end of things. Knee arthritis, another example. So women are more likely to injure their knees playing sports because they've got imbalanced mus muscle strength in their legs and looser, typically, ligaments. And so that manifests into more injuries and ACL tears. And of course, walking in these high heel shoes doesn't help us much either, right? So uh, we're our own worst enemy. But at the end of the day, those are things that are compounded by environmental and physiological factors, and we've got to consider all of those as we treat implants. So in my world of 3D printing, it's moving towards a custom printed solution, but today, men, women, children, uh, seniors have basically eight models of knee implants from which to choose. I don't know about you, but I'm certainly different than you are, and you are, and our knees are very different. So I have to figure out, if I pick one of those eight, or my doctor picks one of those eight, that means that he's going to conform my body to fit that, or tailor the implant to fit me. I can tell you that's not a perfect solution. The readmissions and the failed implants are prevalent because it's not a perfect solution. And we're struggling with how do we get to perfect or as close to perfect as we can to make it good. Now, interestingly, here's a converse scenario. Osteoporosis. It's more common in women, yes, because they've got less bone tissue than men. And they ex experience a lot of rapid bone loss. They get that thing called menopause and the hormone shifts. So it manifests into this well-recognized and stereotypical ascription that osteoporosis is a woman's disease. However, men that are over the age of 50 often go undetected for this condition because we think it's a woman's disease. So these factors play in both sides of the gender divide. But at the end of the day, today healthcare is, is really measuring us on very few things that have to do with value-based outcomes. 
Are you lowering costs? Are you increasing productivity by creating digital connectedness to make things move faster and work faster? Or are you giving us a better quality of life? And those are the factors that today are the measures. Tomorrow, they could be impacted tremendously by more thoughtful, deliberate, intentional, upfront work that considers sex and gender. I believe we can do more to impact these value-based outcomes if we start at the beginning and consider how do we treat the individual? How do we personalize the approach to medicine through the available tools to deliver the right solution to the right person at the right time and achieve better outcomes in healthcare? Because no two people are alike and because every cell has a sex, we've got to learn to eliminate the gender blind spots. But how are we gonna do that? And in my world, I've said, I look at everything in 3D, right? Because I'm able to investigate and see anatomy that's personal, individual. And I love what I do. Not only are we 3D printing body parts, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So what we're also doing is building in AI to do everything from anomaly detection to predictive intelligence in what's interesting, not just the body, but manufactured parts. Because we can learn to discern the deltas and anomalies in healthcare through the 3D scan technology. And so we're focused on employing the digital space so that the MRI machines that, that are being used like Siemens and GE and others have a chance to, at the upfront, without human inter intervention, actually reduce cost and identifying anomalies or perhaps characteristics that are indicative of certain diseases and disease states or perhaps uh, temporal 3D scans that can be compared across uh, the ages for a particular individual. And so I think this technology uh, holds a lot of promise to be able to, to impact uh, both knee implants and uh, detection of healthcare conditions, printing 3D parts of, of bodies, which I don't think is going to take very long. But uh, we need to get together and we need to coalesce a team and a group of like-minded individuals that see the value, the value of individualized, personalized precision medicine. And the groups that I'm associated with, uh, specifically the Women in Bio chapter of Chicago that I currently serve as president, along with the American Medical Women's Association where I am the tech and innovation lead, coupled with the White House and uh, precision medicine initiatives and all of the other groups that are fundamental in funding and supporting this gendered innovation, Stanford and other groups uh, that, that are coming together to really create some transparency and some visibility around this, the importance of this topic. We've got to learn to start taking in genetics, age, body composition, body size, ethnicity, disabilities as factors that really impact and influence the outcome of health treatment. But we've got to start with data, which all of you know all about, right? We've got to start collecting the right kind of data. We've got to understand at the front end, not the back end, how to design and devise based on individualized approaches to treatments, not the 75 kilogram white male. So together, we are employing these, these um, initiatives and inserting our expertise. What I'm doing personally, uh, in addition to recognizing that this is really important and could have tremendous impact on the overall way we, we proceed with healthcare and treatment, working with the IOT side of the house. I'm also part of the M-Hub board. And if you haven't visited the M-Hub facility on Chicago, please do come as my guest. It's 63,000 square feet of prototyping space, 
with all kinds of toys for those that love to build and make stuff. And so this is a, a particular unique value proposition that I see as an opportunity for innovators in the IoT space and particularly in the healthcare space. There are others, companies like Transcelerate, who are taking clinical trial and, and changing how it's manifested. So they take and they centralize and streamline principal investigator data all in one place so you don't have to do it twice and repeat and waste time. And so that kind of efficiency and productivity is profound and will impact the way these trials can be done and, and speed to market. And I think that those are where the opportunities lie in the data fields as well. So you have different portable different portals for different organizations, but they still maintain the same uh, centralized uh, data for the, uh, the, the principles involved. So biopharma is going to change uh, radically with these kinds of collaborative solutions. What I'm doing to change the world is launching an idea accelerator with the American Medical Women's Association because not only is there a need to factor sex and gender on the front end of anything, but we need to invite those women that are not only having full-time jobs, but they're also coming up with the ideas that they don't have time to take forward. So this is a safe harbor where they can be part of a community that res respects and recognizes they have value and that their value is really profound and we want to help extract the ideas and help to commercialize them or vet them in the right place, the right time, and the right manner. And I invite you to join me and Dr. Neelam Agrawal from Rush University. She's a, a highly recognized Alzheimer's specialist. And she is, with me, moving forward and disrupting the way that entrepreneurs connect with doctors and the community and the patients so that we can run pilots and we can take these ideas and figure out how to make them work and how to make them successful quickly because time kills all deals and opportunities. And that is my uh, life's work and my passion and I invite you to join me. If you want to join our AI efforts, our accelerator efforts, 3D printing efforts, MHUB, any of the various areas, I invite you and welcome you. Um, happy to take any questions. All right, first question. Um, is there anything that uh, you or the people you're working with are doing to change medical education to make students more aware of that 75 kilogram white male is not necessarily the right standard to use? Absolutely. So Stanford is really the, the leader in, in doing this. Uh, Laura Bush is at uh, Texas Tech, put together uh, an entire curriculum and symposium around the the, this topic and is pushing it forward. Uh, there's efforts to try to integrate it into the medical education curriculum. And if you've tried to do that with anything, uh, there's extreme pushback because there's no room for anything anymore. But I think they have to get smarter about how to introduce this. Uh, we've, we've worked with and talked with um, a lot of the AMA folks and um, AMWA folks about how do we get this to be a topic of import and there are committees within that structure that we're working with collaboratively and in fact uh, Dr. Nancy Church sits on the AMA diversity board um, and she's the president of the Chicago chapter of AMWA so we are uh, trying to position our key opinion leaders and thought leaders to make that change happen but it never happens as fast as certainly I want it or most people want it. So, I have three questions, okay. <laughs> Just do one. Just do one? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, so the population is aging, right? And we know for sure women's lives more than men. 
do how do you think this is shaping the forces of the market through this kind of I mean the future maybe is not going to be the future um, is female yeah I just asked Dory McWhorter from the Y right so these forces are pushing the market that's my question I'm not sure what you're asking are you wanting to know how is how is the fact that women are going to live longer going to affect I'm I'm I may have missed something no, uh, yeah, I mean, the women are living longer. They are going to pay. And the market is moving my money. So how is this going to affect the medical industry of the future? That's my point. Wow. If I could answer that question, I think I wouldn't be here. Um, that's, that's a really uh, difficult question for me. I think uh, I'm not... I'm not the person to answer that question, uh, but it's a hell of a question. So, eventually, I will invest in a drone that will fly the microphone to the right spot. Hello, my family is in the medical field and um, my mom is a lactation consultant. And I've seen um, with her profession, and my dad is a, an infectious disease doctor in academia, and I've seen with her profession kind of um, almost a derisiveness about women's specific healthcare. And I'm wondering, is that just my family? <laughs> um, and, or is that an attitude in medicine in general, and what is being done to address that? So I don't think it's you. I think it's a broad problem. And, uh, you know, it, it, it comes down to almost uh, this simple little fact that the mice in clinical trials are cheaper as male mice than female mice. And so the path of least resistance is what typically gets adopted, right? You don't have to uh, employ the, the female mice because they have hormonal complexities and they get pregnant and they cost more. And so I think that we're more, a little more complicated and that's an overgeneralization, but I think that's what tends to happen because we're multitaskers, we think about so many things and we create um, a more thoughtful engagement with the healthcare community and I think uh, we bear the burden of caregiving, uh, especially in Alzheimer cases, and I, I, I see that as a, a persistent problem that we get saddled with more and can't do more to heal ourselves and take care of ourselves in many cases. But I think um, it is a recognized problem. It's not yours uh, solely. What's being done about it? I think women are starting to speak up and emp be empowered. And through groups like Women in Bio, AMWA, and other groups, we're starting to partner together. And, and we've been doing that. And that's, that's getting around our table and having those conversations to declare what the problems are. I was at an Alzheimer's roundtable uh, last month. And people from across the country coming together to share their stories about their problems and, and their challenges as physicians and how are they going to uh, basically uh, traverse the climate within their own hospital systems, within their own uh, kind of healthcare handcuffs. And those are real problems uh, in the healthcare field as a patient, as a doctor, there's, there's so many things, and that's why I see the value of an AMWA accelerator to be profound, because those women identify the problems that they also see solutions for. And if we can give them a safe harbor to, to bring that into the mix, we can help uh, liberate or at least catalyze ideas to, to break 
the way the patterns that are in place today. Um, I'm going to do my best to articulate my very complicated question. Um, I'm curious, is you're working in this field that's essentially trying to make healthcare more personalized and less model based. Um, do you see like an intersection between uh, the need for systemic healthcare reform and like politics and public policy? Uh, does that intersect with this more personalized technology so that people have more of a role in the healthcare that they receive and that it's personalized for them not only you know physically but also you know they also have more equitable access to it uh, in ways that they can uh, afford and uh, yeah yeah That's my I think shot. my quick answer is yes absolutely yes um, how are we going to do that um, I think disruptive technologies like the 3d printing world are going to be profound in allowing us to deliver solutions that are customized and tailored to each of us. So everything from shoes. You're seeing 3D printed shoes becoming more and more mainstream and accessible and uh, affordable. And I think that's where we're going to see it. But we've got to check and put the lens of gender before we start looking at the treatment options. And I think that's where we can begin moving in the right direction and making the right decisions to get us down the pipe of uh, better health care. But I think it's intrinsically inseparable. And I feel really bad. Do you have another question? Because I'm not a health care economist, and I couldn't even pretend to be. I have a lot of questions. I think it's important. Okay. Um, my question is sort of based on that a little bit, but it's kind of interesting, I think, in healthcare right now and looking at the way that it used to be really about charts, right? And it was all about the individual charts, and you might see a chart that has a long narrative about the patient, or the patient, the client, and um, their whole medical history. And we really shifted away from that when we go to electronic medical records and we start looking at a lot of big data, and we're looking at a lot of results um, oriented data at a, a hospital level and then at a you know city and county and up right um, so I'm just wondering it's sort of similar to your question a little bit just on how it's interesting the idea of and I fully agree obviously of needing to get close to the patient and understand the individual and those individual issues but it almost feels like we have for good and bad reasons gone a, a bit away from that within healthcare um, and I'm just wondering if you can if you can speak to that, this um, it seems like a push-pull a little bit on moving away from the individual so that we can say, you know, these hospitals meet these requirements, even with an ACA, which, I mean, can't even go into that right now. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know if you could just speak to that in a minute. So I think we're collecting tons of data, right? It's the new norm. And as we collect more data, we're actually depersonalizing the intersect engagement of the physician with the patient, right? Because right? they've got their backs and they're doing all the data and they're trying to check all the boxes and it's not a happy place for them. Uh, tremendous uh, amount of, uh, uh, I guess, disillusionment and uh, depression in the medical field with doctors committing suicide. It's a, it's a real problem. and. I don't think that's because of data. I think there's just a lot of factors that play into that. But um, I think it's really important that we do find a way to streamline and collect data. And I think where we're going to eventually find ourselves is with some tremendously intelligent algorithms that are going to employ AI and machine learning to do some complex reasoning that will allow us to do the job more efficiently and, and release the time that the doctor is encumbered by del key, key, key um, what do they call it? Um, keyboarding, keyboarding, and, and, and or rekeying or co correcting. And I think that's uh, kind of the salvo that we should be shooting for, is if we're going to collect this, we got to figure out how to make it less 
uh, heavy on the system and the people delivering the, the care. And it's, it's got to go back to a more personal approach, right? So I think if, if we can reach that level, that would be amazing. Yeah, so my question is about data now. So I know how it works, okay? So you go, a patient goes to, the, to a clinic or whatever, go to the MR machine, and then there is a bunch of data there. But who owns that, this data? So right now, um, Watson, for example, the Watson guys, owns tons and tons of data. So how we liberate this data for people like that is here works with that. So I would love to get all that data. There are a number of companies that have, have these um, incredible vaults in the, in the cloud of all of your MRI data, right? And there's a challenge because uh, it used to be Dell had one of the biggest VNRs, uh, Vendor Neutral Archives, or VNAs. And you store all this data, and it stays there. Who owns it? I suspect the patient has rights because it's their data. The uh, truth or the, the ideology goes, if you de-identify the data, then it's generic. No one knows whose it is unless you have a really uh, unique use case and you, by virtue of the disease state, can identify and connect with someone, then it's no longer really de-identified. And so there's, there's a huge number of layers that we have to go through. And then once the people die, do, does their family own it? Does it go to the company who's paying the money to store the data, the hospital or the, the provider? Lots of complexities. Um, there are companies overseas that have aggregated population data in these archives and are, are selling access to it for um, researchers to borrow and create algorithms that then they uh, get a piece of the you know, license for it. So there's, there's lots of things happening all across the globe, and I think it's very variable. Uh, I don't know that 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 personal security and privacy has been even talked about uh, very much about those scans. But I certainly would love to have access to a lot of that data. I could do so many things with the AI technology that, that we're doing. But it's, it's much like a lot of the privacy concerns we have on other types of data. But this is real, and this is your body, and at what point do you relinquish ownership of, of that kind of a, a scan? It's, it's a lovely conversation that we could talk about forever, but, but be aware that that's there, and most of your data is in the cloud. And uh, actually, Dell has sold to NTT data, so that's there. And then you have Toshiba with Vital Images, and you have uh, Siemens and GE with other uh, partners as well. So. Uh, great question. Uh, no answer, and uh, I suspect it's one of those things where the data lives where it lives, and whoever accesses it can decide and have decision rights around it. So I think we have time for one more question. We have one here and there. Um, how does the current regulatory environment on 3D printing and on uh, medical devices affect the work that you're doing? Great question. So it's, it's less about the uh, regulatory space, although they've been more reactive to the market. So they've accepted submissions and in some cases in an express fashion to accelerate the adoption. So it's, it's more, they haven't kind of globally uh, approved anything, but they are being responsive and, and they, as of, I, I think last year there were like 85 3D printed uh, things, devices or drugs or whatever uh, that were approved um, in that uh, pipeline and that continues to flow. The hiccup for us 
in employing 3D printing in the medical space really has to do with who's going to pay. There's no CPT code. There's nobody willing to charge back. The hospital doesn't want to pay. The doctor doesn't want to pay. And the patient likely won't unless it's a um, vanity play. So Mirror Me 3D out of New York does the pre and post reconstructive augmentation, you know, uh, face um, plastic surgery. So in those cases, that's discretionary income, and they can decide to do that. They can have a 3D printed selfie, which we also do. But uh, it's it's more right now that that there's no gateway to reimbursement, and the value has not been quantified sufficiently to move people to, to make this a priority. And, and we try to push on that as well. Uh, I serve on the subcommittee for 3D imaging standards uh, in, across the country. And we're trying to at least create a, a, a repeatable, credible uh, definition of what a good scan is so that you would have some uh, something to stand on when you're seeking that kind of uh, reimbursement. So. Great. Well, every, let's give a big hand to our speaker.